Okay. 1974, 1975, I'm with my wife and another couple, the Colorado River, uh, camped out on the bank of the river right by, by a bridge, and um, we're, we're tripping. And what has happened is we're, we're around a big campfire, and my wife made the campfire. My wife at the time, her name is Sharon. Um, and it was the first campfire she ever made. And I didn't think too much about it, but she had made it from, from debris from inside the car, uh, sh uh, trash bags and things like that. Well, it turns out that one of the trash bags had a box of 22 shells in it from a hunting trip that I had been on the year before where I was like trying to shoot rabbits and I couldn't shoot a rabbit. I just couldn't do it. So all the shells were unused. So there's a bag filled with 22 caliber shells sitting in the middle of a bonfire with four people around it who are peeking on acid about four feet away. All right. So we're having a great time. We're looking at the moon. The sky is sort of fragmenting prismatically and to, you know, auras or auroras of light, and it's all very, very wonderful. And the, there's one of the logs kind of goes like that. And I thought, well, this, this wood's kind of sparky, you know? And a uh, bunch of sparks flew out, and I, I didn't think anything of it. Of course, I wasn't, I was sort of free associating at the time. Um, and a couple of seconds later, nothing happened again, a little explosion, some, some pieces flew out of the fire. And it, it takes you a second to realize what's so-called consensus reality and what's subjective reality. And uh, at that time, I heard kind of a and um, and in one of those sort of insightful, just instantaneous flashes, I knew what had happened. I'd, uh, the shells, I hadn't even thought about the shells in six months, but I knew exactly what had, what had happened. Uh, so I had to put the fire out. So I Somehow, I don't know how I'm functioning because I'm, I'm peaking on acid. I can barely move. I can't, I, I can barely crawl. I'm grabbing people and pushing them behind the car as these 22 shells are going like that. So I think I've got to put the fire out. So and I'm actually not quite fully peaked. It's coming on it's like, like a locomotive at this time. And I start crawling down toward the water with a, with a bucket. I have no idea where I got the bucket. Don't ask. I go down to the water, I'm in the dark, the ground is kind of undulating like, I seem to recall an image of it being like a bunch of snakes, kind of snakes in mud, except it was solid ground. Crawl down to the river, I get a bucket of water, I crawl back to the fire, now I'm a commando. I'm crawling across the ground like this, and these 22 shells are going like that out of the fire. And about, about this time, this guy comes, comes kind of bopping down the, the road going, hey man, somebody's shooting at us, what's going on? That's my memory of it. Whether the guy was there or, not, there or not, I'm not really sure. I have the bucket of water. I'm creeping up stealthily on the fire. And about this time, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much fully on um, uh, from the acid. And I get right in front of the fire. Now, I haven't thought through the consequences of throwing a bucket of cold water into a roaring bonfire at a range of about two feet while you're on acid. I get up there. I dump the water in. I'm kind of looking down at it. And, of course, there's this violent steam explosion, which I see in kind of separate jump cuts. You know, first there's no explosion, and then there's, you know, it sort of goes tick, 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 like that. And just knocks me backward. Not that I actually got hit by anything, but just perceptually knocking backward. And I fell down the, fell down the uh, bank into the water. So I'm laying in the Colorado River. There's this big, you know, volcano of steam, and the tragedy was averted. There were two bullet holes in the car, and... Uh, <laughs> And <laughs> no one was hurt. So, let that be a lesson to you, kids. What? Another lesson. <laughs> Another drug-related tragedy. <laughs> no. Um, obviously, uh, don't hunt rabbits. <laughs> um, uh, 1973, window pane acid, Needles, California. Uh, camped out on the bank of the Colorado River. You may notice a thematic motif here. Uh, parked uh, uh, camp right next to a uh, a long bridge, the Needles Municipal Town Bridge, which is no longer started. I really tried to that one. Kind of into me. Okay, it's 1973. Uh, peaking on window pane acid on the banks of the Colorado River in Needles, California. Uh, about uh, 50 feet from the Needles Municipal Town Bridge, which doesn't exist anymore, and uh, having a good time watching the car headlights coming across the bridge as they are fragmented prismatically through the um, through the railing of the bridge. Very stroboscopic effect, and uh, very hypnotic under the influence of the uh, of the LSD. 
Uh, I'm with uh, three other people, my wife at the time, Sharon, and, and uh, another couple. And uh, the um, the guy, the other couple, had never done acid before. And uh, he, I, I had uh, been working on him a little bit. <laughs> I was a very supportive uh, co-tripper. I'd been working on him about the about the police earlier, and uh, he had he had uh, generated some fairly severe paranoia. And we were joking that every time a car came across the bridge, it was a police car. And it, kind of working him up into a lather, shouldn't have done it. And uh, this went on for an hour or so. And uh, every time a car came came across the bridge, we'd see ten times more lights than were really there, and think that that the yeah the entire uh, national guard was descending on us, and got a big kick out of it. Finally, the car comes across the bridge, stops about fifty feet from us, up at the top of the embankment turns on a spotlight, shines down on us, illuminating the ground all around, just this pure white radiance. And it's a real poli- it's a real cop. And this, this guy who's been sitting on his sleeping bag the whole time gets this incredulous look on his face and he stands up in the middle of the spotlight and points at the, pol- at the, at the police car and yells at the top of his lungs, he's real, he's real, like this. <laughs> The cop who already knew that he was real <laughs> must have thought that that was something he did not even want to mess with. He got back in his car and drove away. End of story. This is an experience on uh, psilocybin mushrooms, um, which I had um, which I had taken. I was on the on the downside, way way past way past the peak, but still still into fairly fairly severe visual distortion and I was sitting in the dark uh, by myself four o'clock in the morning thinking I had been watching television or something and I was just sitting thinking looking out the window it had been perfectly calm still throughout the entire night and as I looked out the window I noticed the plants in the backyard which were large ferns starting to slowly undulate from side to side uh, as if they were being whipped by a strong wind. And there hadn't been a breath of wind. I'd been sitting outside in a lawn chair for, for a couple of hours previously, and there hadn't been a breath of wind. It was dead still. And these plants started started moving. And I remember it very clearly because I was thinking that the window looked like an aquarium and it looked like seaweed kind of moving it in the aquarium. And I got this strange sense of dread for no no tangible reason that I could, that I could remember. I focused it on maybe that there was a burglar or there was a and that there was a fowler or something or something and I reacted the way I normally do when I get a strong sense of dread. I went to the kitchen to leave myself a snack. As I walked into the kitchen, uh, this earthquake hit. There was a 5.9, I think. And all of a sudden, you know, being on a being on a hallucinatory drug and being being hit by an earthquake was very, you know, very very bizarre experience. Um, I remembered in, this, in a flash that my wife was sleeping under a painting which was mounted on the wall, which had always made me nervous, that was, in a, that was covered in glass, and it was about four feet wide. And all I could think of was that the earthquake was going to knock the painting off, it was going to shatter, and large shards of glass were going to hit her on the bed. So I started running, and I lived in a house that was very narrow and very, very long. I called it the Orient Express. It was... Uh, it was a, like a 120-foot run from where I was standing to the to the bedroom, and I just started running, or maybe a 100-foot run. I just started running, and I was running down down this narrow corridor like a bat out of hell, and the power cuts out as a result of the earthquake, calling knocking down some power line. So I'm running in total blackness, um, on a hallucinogen in an earthquake, and I run smack into the wall, knock myself out. So my wife is on her own from that point on. I didn't really knocked myself out, but I was stunned, and it took me uh, the duration of the rest of the earthquake to, to kind of come to and crawl on the floor and get into the bedroom itself. So, she I, wake up. She slept through the whole thing, of course, but she always did. She missed all the good earthquake. But you went in and told her that and I saved her. I took credit for it. We normally have a pretty clear memory of the experiences on on uh, acid this with this was on acid um but i have only a uh, only a dim sense of what this really was uh i had either double or triple dosed i, I don't remember and i was in a darkened room 
wasn't completely black, but it was quite dark. And I had been watching television. The television was on. And at the absolute peak of the experience, it formed like a tunnel where the television just went further and further away. It just came, became this abstract light source that eventually I recall it going red and this very strong sort of roaring sound as if I was uh, uh, had my head stuck into a jet engine, maybe, and basically saw nothing, just this kind of uh, input void shot through with, uh, with red light and this intense roaring sound, which eventually took on a kind of a rhythm, surf-like, surf-like rhythm. Um, and then that gradually dissipated and came back to, uh, to you know, a more uh, accurate view of the world, and then I could get up and function, so on, normally. But there was a period of, I'm not sure how long, it, uh, it may have been uh, 20 minutes to, to two hours, where I basically saw nothing. Were you afraid? No, I, I liked it. I thought it was cool. I was a, I was a little afraid in the sense that, that because you have no, no real bearings in a situation like that, you don't know how long it's going to last or whether it will increase to a point where, where uh, you... I, I never felt the total death of myself as a point of view in terms of like the death of ego I, idea. I always kind of knew that I was, I was there checking this out. So I wasn't, I wasn't really afraid in that sense. My, my point of view hadn't dissolved completely. But I think that was probably the most extreme experience. And for me, it was the most extreme experience because I was basically sitting there looking at things and not seeing anything. So it was a complete perceptual wall. And how long do you think it lasted? It could have been between 20 minutes and, and two hours. I, I, I have no sense of time. I, I'm sure that medically someone who knows more about the drug could be able to, to pin that down. It may have been five minutes to half an hour. You know, it's very hard to say. It wasn't like it just all suddenly went black. It just... It just became so abstract that it had no meaning. And it wasn't abstract in the sense of beautiful, intricate mandala geometrics or something like that. It was just raw, naked, black, primal, stop. No sound either? Just the roaring. The roaring sound. No real sense of motion, though, like I was moving. Yeah, and I actually, I actually kind of liked it. I really, I really liked, uh, I liked being able to be there at that vantage point. It, I, I looked at it the way I look at almost all experiences in life. I liked the opportunity to be there and see that. And was it, uh, did it have the feeling of being with God? Any, no, it, I, I've never had, I spent to, I've never had what you would call a spiritual experience in that sense. Um, I've, the closest I've come maybe was, uh, on on mushrooms, a perception of certain certain universalities that maybe exist in all all human minds at a certain level that maybe are reached uh, uh, during a uh, a uh, hallucinogenic drug experience, uh, where you get down to some level in your in your mind down in the limbic system or something that that we all share in common. Maybe kind of like a, in the near death near death experience where everybody gets to the the same level of brain function. And they see the same the same thing. I'm, I have no idea why I thought at the time that it was a universal thing, but I just I felt that. Mm-hmm. And I remembered. I also remembered that at that point too. This was this was on on uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Sometime later, I remember at that point thinking that um, there was a there was a, a sort of a separate reality. <laughs> bad, news, bad choice of terms, but there was a separate reality in one's own continuum of, of brain function when one was on a hallucinogenic drug as opposed to, to day-to-day re- reality, and there was continuity through that. In other words, when you're on a trip, you can remember, I, I felt like I could remember previous trips and previous experiences in a way that I couldn't remember them when I was, when I was back to, to normal, normal uh, day-to-day reality. So I actually felt that there was the, the capability to, to build from one to the next. And did you attempt that? Go back to some previous, not in the sense of direct memory, but I. But there was a sense of of a, of a familiarity of certain sounds and, and physical experiences and uh, visual distortions. That um, you know, I, I felt I felt that I was on on uh, uh, recognizable ground, recognizable terrain. What about your worst experience? Never really had a bad experience. I never really had a terrible except running into the wall. Except running into <laughs> the wall, but that was <laughs> you know, an earthquake descending on you in the middle of a in the middle of a trip, I suppose, is a bad experience. Uh yeah, I suppose that would probably be my worst experience because the exact moment that the earthquake hit was like this tremendous jolt. It was like an explosion. At first I thought it was an explosion, like a like a mortar bomb or something like that. Because 
And once again, of course, yeah, it was real. I knew it was real. I knew that something was happening that was real, but that was that was like I, that was the hand of God because all of a sudden the, ho- the house started to move. And, and and take your normal reaction to an earthquake, which is that sort of sense of mortality, helplessness, inability to act, something larger than yourself, amplify it by a hundred times, and that's what I felt at that moment. And that's why it made that so memorable uh, because it literally was. I'm not religious, but that's the closest I've ever come to directly feeling at a, at a sort of physical and emotional level, that the hand of God, something that is so much bigger than me that I, I can't do anything about it. And also the helplessness of, of being slightly impaired physically and not, not able to deal with an emergency situation. And has that experience affected how you feel um, about uh, God anyway now? No, no, I, I, I'm sorry to report you know, news from the front that I haven't, <laughs> I haven't changed my opinion about that. I've never had, I've never had like a, like a mystical experience that, that I don't, I don't necessarily believe that there's some other plane of existence that can be reached through, through hallucinogens. I only, I only believe that what you, what you're allowed to do on these drugs is take the, the sort of the deck of reality and play 52 pickup with it. Just throw all the cards in the air and let them land in, in different, different order, you know, reshuffle it and see different associations. It just allows you to kind of get outside normal reality and look at it from the from the side that's 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 why I do it I, I don't I don't feel that I'm that I'm pushing through to something that really exists that can only be reached this way I know other people do believe that but I don't I feel that that's that's a trick of the mind I think that there are certainly realms within my own mind that it allows me to explore and it allows me to make uh, associations and have sort of little perceptual leaps that I, I might not otherwise have. So it's certainly worth the worth head pricing. And experiences similar to these um, without drugs. Oh yeah, sure, but but to a, to a lesser degree. Um, yeah, I think um, I think you can have that sort of experience just sitting and just sitting and thinking if you do it long enough. You know, if you if you can exclude the exclude distractions enough and just concentrate on a, on a given subject. I, they're just not as strong. You don't feel them at a physical level. I think these. I think one of the things about about uh, acid is that, or or you know, other hallucinogens as well, is that you can you can feel an intellectual thing at a physical level and has tremendous power as it as it sort of crashes through your, through your body, and it makes it, it makes it very memorable. Are you able to be creative on acid? On acid, no, no. You've tried. Um, I've never actually even tried. I've never really been able to to get up and move at the exact moment that I was having these thoughts. And it's, it's a bit frustrating because you know that you never remember them with the intensity that you perceive them at that particular moment. You've never tried to write them down? No, no. I, I've never tried to write them down at the time they were happening. Or paint? I don't think I could paint. But then my, my, my style of painting is very representational very very focused i don't think i could just sort of start slashing around color basically i think your your motor coordination is not good enough to be able to express what's happening i don't feel very articulate other people may may do that maybe that's a discipline that one can learn and you've never had a bummer no i've never had a self-induced bummer in that sense of of coming across some sort of dark corridor in my uh in my mind that I that I would have preferred not to open. Uh, all my acid trips were with my um, my ex-wife Sharon, and she never she never had a bummer either. And, and I think sometimes being with I, I'm I'm assuming that being with a person who who uh, uh, maintains well emotionally uh, may be may be significant. Mm-hmm. Is it something you recommend to people that have never done it before? Oh, it's a very guarded recommendation because I don't think. You know, I don't think it's for everyone. I think that there are, there are people that have a fairly fragile grasp of consensus reality, as it as in their normal lives, and this is this would be the last thing that would help them. But I think that uh, it's not as harmful as a lot of other people uh, might assume it to be. Uh, I would recommend it to certain people. Do you think it should be legal? Well, I mean, obviously, you know. Subjectively, I would say it should be it should be available legally, possibly via you know prescription to you know psychiatrist or or whatever, so that it can be it can be 
another in the in the lexicon of tools of uh, of therapy or you know whatever how about legal for fun that's a tough issue i think that's a tough issue i probably haven't given that enough thought cuz obviously that's how you've done it yeah I, for me it for me it's purely recreational it's been purely recreational i don't know it's it's pretty hard to answer that question without sounding like you have a double standard or Hard for me to answer that question without sounding like I have a double standard. And what would the double standard? Double standard would be yeah. I, I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to be prosecuted for having done it. But I also don't think it should be legal because I think that there are people could, who could harm themselves with it. So, that sounds like a you know, double standard. Just making a, uh, an age limit. You take care. Of. I don't think it's a function of age. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the argument that a young impressionable mind can be could be affected by it deleteriously more so than that an older person I think can be countered by the fact that I think young young people can withstand almost anything in, a, in the you know physically and and emotionally more than they can let than people can later in life uh, they can withstand direct direct trauma or, or whatever once so uh, you know that's an argument that can go back and forth I really don't have the thought of the facts on that but I do feel that age limit is not the answer to it. Okay. Uh, you said that you put off doing it. You didn't do it when you were young. That's right. I, I was uh, a number of my friends were, were doing it, and it was in uh, sort of 1968, 69, 70. Uh, I lived in Canada at the time, so we were getting that kind of crest of the wave of the 60s a, a couple of years later than, than everybody else, at least where I lived, fairly, fairly sort of remote from the major centers, cultural centers. And uh, you were interested in everything else of the counterculture. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I was, I was, you know, politically, I would say I was very radical. I was not conservative at all. And you but that one, music and, and the music and everything else. And I was, I was probably one of the, at, at a conceptual level, one of the wildest kids in the school. But for me personally, the loss of, of physical control or mental control inherent in any kind of drug uh alcohol marijuana whatever uh was an abhorrent concept but basically it was it was a bit puritanical it was not an informed decision it was just a fear uh, of loss of control loss of personal control and it took me a while to break through that what changed uh, having somebody that that uh that i trusted say that it would be all right and just seeing seeing basically see he didn't die from it you know after after a couple of years and what led up to you doing it the first time? Was it a big, big decision or more spontaneous? It was, yeah, I think it was a fairly spontaneous decision at that at that point. I mean, in other words, I had reached a point where I, I was comfortable doing something like that. I had enough confidence. How old? Uh, 22, 23, something like that. Jim? Uh, let's see. Any other general thoughts about what it does, how it works? Well, I mean, I've read I've read uh, the scientific literature of what it does at a at a biochemical level in terms of you know altering the neurotransmitter function and that sort of thing, but I don't think that ultimately tells you anything. I think you could you could probably be a scientist and study LSD your entire life and not understand it if you didn't ever take any. And that's the that's the biggest problem is that it's entirely subjective. Even your own memory of an acid experience is is a shabby tin type photograph of something that 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 happened uh our memory just can't can't keep the you know the physical emotional visual details of something that that intense you have to do it and there's no way to 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 tell somebody about it and i don't think there's any way of of bringing it back either cinematically or uh in in uh or literary, uh, literarily, or, or any other way um it just has to be directly experienced and it's an entirely subjective thing so in that way, I think it's very good because it can be a confidence builder. You're in a world by yourself, basically, in the world of your own mind, and you have to you have to learn how to deal with it. And there, those are building blocks. They, there. I think that if it if it goes well, it can be confidence building. You'll find out a basic sense of of yourself and what your what your capabilities are at a very raw and primal level. What do you make of the ESP or clairvoyant aspect of with people you're with when you're on the drug? I think it can communicate without speaking. I've had that. I've had that feeling. I had an interesting experience once um, on on one trip at, at um, with with my wife again. We were we were alone, 
And I had a pet lizard, this, uh, a monitor lizard, and uh, it was normally, normally for, uh, it was a very aggressive creature, but uh, when provoked, but unless it was physically provoked, it would just lay in its cage and never move. And I had this, this strange uh, experience that, that while we were peeking on the, on the drug, the lizard went bananas for no external physical reason. We were sitting on the couch nearby, 10, 15 feet away, basically not moving, not doing anything, not talking. And it just went absolutely insane, lashing around in its cage. It was hitting the glass with its tail so, so hard that I was certain it was going to break it. It had never done that before, and it never did it since. And I got the strange sense that it was somehow responding to us. But whether there's a physical explanation for that, I don't know. Maybe we emit a certain, you know, we, we communicate chemically at a level we don't really understand very well in terms of pheromones. Possibly there may have been some sort of biochemical reason for it to do that. Um, but I had an uncanny sense at the time that it was just responding to our, to our mental state. I could have seen that that could be sociological as far as the lizard saw you behaving in a way that he doesn't normally see you behave. Yeah, but that, but that, uh, the the lizard is functioning on a very, very tiny chip, basically, and and is almost completely immune to the behavior of, of humans around it, uh, except it's a very immediate sphere. If you put your hand in its cage, it would it would attack it. But it, you could tap on the glass, make faces, do things. People would come in and out all day, pass it, and and it would never react that way. So I I can't buy that from from the standpoint of the normal senses of of sight sight and hearing. What did uh, you think at the time? At the time, I thought that the lizard was responding to our to our uh, to our state, to our you know altered perceptual state. Did you try to communicate with it more? I think I went over and looked at it, um, and it was just so insane. It was actually quite quite a powerful display of energy, of extremely primal energy on the part of this creature. It just went nuts. But you know, but I think there's a possible a possible physical explanation for that, which is that. Very, very, very microscopic amounts of, of LSD obviously can have an effect on, probably can have an effect on the nervous system of a simple creature, and it may have been communicated through the air or something like that in the sense that a pheromone can be communicated through sweat or whatever. You know, only a few molecules might be enough to, to trigger off such a simple creature. Just a theory, but I, I tend to, I, the way my mind works, I always tend to go for a physical explanation before some ephemeral, ephemeral, you know, unproven energy or vibration that has never been indicated. I mean, I studied physics before I started as a filmmaker. And, you know, I've got a lot of faith in the physical universe. One man's opinion. One thing that I specifically remember, and it's, a, it's an image, I was standing in front of the bathroom mirror with a carton of milk for some reason. Don't ask me how that came to happen. And uh, I was slightly past peak, and I was moving around, but I was still, still very, uh, very, very heavily involved in, in, in visual auditory distortions, and so on. And uh, I took a big, big drink from this carton of milk, and I was watching myself in the mirror, and I had this strange perception of myself as completely removed from the normal upright plane of gravity, where I didn't see myself as an upright being. I saw myself as if, and this is going to sound strange, not that I saw myself as an earthworm, but I saw myself in, as an earthworm in the sense that I was a tube that took elements from the world in at one end and passed them out at the other end. Um, no, it wasn't a scatological vision at all. It was just simply, I'm this tube. And the entire uh, living world consists of tubes of various types that take part of the physical world in one end and pass it out the other end. And that's what they do. And all of the other functions, whether you're a fish and you have fins or a bird and you fly or you're a human and you walk upright, uh, all of those things are only appurtenances to the basic function of getting the tube to a point where it can ingest matter from the world and pass it through itself and go out the other end. Meanwhile, it has to avoid other tubes which want to pass it through them, and it also has to have a brain which is at various levels of, of development for different creatures to determine how best to do that. Um, how to find it, how to uh, uh, so, uh, dissociate the, the bad from the good, the things that, that will, you know, do you harm from the things that won't, and uh, avoid getting uh, getting passed through other tubes. That's an interesting perception. I mean, it's just an alternate way of looking at everything. But but it, it took away all sense of, 
I'm an upright being. Uh, I felt like I was an illustration in a biology book where you know, everything is always laid out horizontally, whether it's a flatworm, an earthworm, a frog, whatever. It, there's no it, Primates are really the only creatures that move on an upright plane anyway. So this, it, basically it was probably some sort of uh, racial memory going back. Do you think uh, you can have forks? I don't see no way to phrase this question. As a scientist, you have a scientific background. Do you imagine you could have thoughts that could lead to a scientific breakthrough on, on this? Absolutely. I think so. Absolutely. At the level of, of, um, of physics, of, of very, uh, very pure science, physics and mathematics, quantum physics and things like that. Um, I think you could, you could make associations. You could, you, could, um, you could think about energy and the movement of... of particles and so on 